first of all, as a reminder, one, we can be, uh, or another reason is to become more intentional with it. A third reason is that we're living in a culture that is not biblical. And so there are pressures on us to move away from biblical standards. And so it's wise for us to understand where the biblical standards are and not buy into the culture that we have today. Well, we started off by mentioning that prosperity is being content with enough. Wealth is having more than we can consume. And we made the observation that by those definitions, most of us in here are probably wealthy. Isn't that interesting? See, we too, we're too often we want to compare ourselves to Bill Gates, <laughs> right? But if we use an objective standard there, we can probably have more than we can consume. Um, we started off with these seven principles, and principle number one, of course, was that it's better to be blessed than to be wealthy. I'd rather be blessed than be wealthy anyway, right? <laughs> Uh, the, the second thing we talked about is that prosperity is earned. And uh, the bulk of that message is not that something we don't know, but the fact that in our culture, and especially uh, we've been talking about redistribution of wealth and things like that, simply saying that, hey, in the Bible, that's not the way it works. In the Bible, you earn prosperity, and you don't uh, play Robin Hood. Uh, it's not there. Uh, today... We are going to uh, depend, uh, talk about the third principle, which is depend upon God to supply your needs and meet your obligations. <coughs> Trust is the, is the short word. If you're going to prosper, you've got you to gotta depend. Let's take a look at uh, the, another uh, one of those scriptures. This is in Luke. This is the parallel to the one in Matthew. Uh, then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, uh, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than the birds? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Uh, consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. That's how God grows the grass in the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. How much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek His kingdom, and these things will be given you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to the poor, provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven, that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroyed. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Well, let's take a look at this text. Jesus begins this sermon saying, do not worry. Do not worry. Now, what worry is, is a state of anxiety and uncertainty over actual or potential problems. Okay? It's a state of anxiety that you have. You're worried, you're anxious, you're uncertain over potential or real problems. Can I tell you something? That we actually worry over more possible problems than real ones. Okay? What might happen? We play what if a lot. Now, there is a certain area of wisdom in dealing with the what if so that you can be prepared. But that's not worry. 
That's just being prepared. Worrying is when we get anxious. How's this going to happen? What if that happens? What about, to, you know? And so what happens is we get ourselves all tied up in emotional knots, worrying. It's about being uns uh, uncertain over actual or potential problems. Um, it's also allowing your mind to dwell on difficulty and trouble. I don't know about you, but I have this tendency when something, a problem is coming along, that it gets in my mind and it goes around and around and around and around. And I'm laying in bed and it's going around and around and around. Okay? That's worry. Now, worry is a choice. That we don't think about very often. But worry is something we choose to do. Now we may feel it pressed on us and things like that, but worry is a choice. We can choose to worry, or we can choose to trust. One of my favorite proverbs, you know, why pray when you can worry? <laughs> but worry is a choice, and we need to keep this in mind. Because what happens is when it starts going around and around and around, we have to learn to shut it off. You say, Pastor, that's difficult. Yes, it is. How do you do that? The answer is you have to refocus what you're thinking about. You have to, um, uh, what I find is, is if, I, if I'm working with things like that, I have to go do something with my hands so that I'm refocusing where my head is going. I don't go read a book. Frankly, I rarely even go pray because what happens is when I'm praying, all, I'm not really talking to God. All I am doing is worrying more. Okay? So if I can really talk to God, I'll pray. But if I'm not really talking to God, I don't pray. I do something to distract myself. Uh, some people will, uh, I think Charlie goes and plays the piano, takes his mind off stuff. Uh, uh, different ones of us do different things. But worry is a choice. And when Jesus says, do not worry, that's in the emphatic. It, it means, stop it. Okay? Okay, it's a choice. What's an antidote for worry? Well, that's what Jesus gives us in this text. First of all, <clears throat> the antidote for worry is consider how God feeds the birds and clothes the flower. Just think about that for just a little bit. Um, it's winter. There are lots of birds around. But they don't starve. Why? Well, in ways that most of us don't know, God provides for them. Now, we haven't had as much snow this year, so I haven't been as uh, compassionate as I was last year. I've got a bird feeder out there, and in the winter, uh, I like to put out bird feed. And I'll run through five pounds of bird feed in a week. Yeah, lots of birds. And and so what, uh, what we do, and you say, well, you're not, God's not feeding them, you're feeding them. Now, come on, give me a break. God allows us to put it out, and we help, and we're actually partnering with Him and doing that stuff, okay? And so, uh, God takes care of the birds. Now, if God takes care of the birds in the winter, when food is scarce for them, what about you? You know what our problem is? It's not worrying if we're going to eat. It's worrying what we're going to fix. 
you, you, know, you go to the refrigerator and say, Honey, there's nothing in the refrigerator to eat. And it's stopped. <laughs> Top to bottom. Uh, it's not that there's nothing in there to eat. There's nothing in there to eat that you want. <laughs> right? Come on. We have plenty. We have plenty. And the Lord takes care of us and the Lord blesses us with that. We're, we're more important than the birds and we need to keep that attitude in mind. A story will suffice here. When I was in college, I was dirt poor. And uh, in order to save money, I moved off campus and I fixed my own meals. My daughters are already smiling. They've already heard this. When I was in college! <laughs> but to eat, I fixed soup in my popcorn popper and boiled hot dogs in my coffee pot. <laughs> it worked. I had enough. I had enough. And to be honest, I was really quite happy. happy. Uh, I mean, to be honest, I kind of brag about it today. You know? Now you think about that. I, I, have, uh, I have a room that has this ugly pink chenille bed spread on it <laughs> with ugly blue rugs. The closet is so cold that in the winter I used it as a refrigerator. <laughs> honest to God. I kept my milk and my mayonnaise in it. <laughs> But I never starved. A terrible coffee bowl. <laughs> You'd be surprised. You know? <laughs> but <laughs> after we got out of college, I had a, a friend that uh, I grew up with. We went to church together. We were there at Dry State at the same time. And uh, he had gotten married. And after we were out of college, and, and uh, get along, we, we met, we were talking. And he said, you know, there were times when Sue and I went over to your place because we knew you'd have something to eat. <laughs> now, I want you to think about that. God provided for me. Okay? There's always soup. There was always hot. Strange refrigerator, <laughs> but enough. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you something. I have come to believe that unless we go through some times where we have to struggle a little bit and really depend upon God, we don't know what dependence upon God is. Okay. Oh, but by the way, I worked for pennies at that time. That's how I put myself through college. And I paid my tithes all the way through. I'd sometimes send home eight, ten dollars, mom to put in the offering plate, but I paid my tithes. I've never been hungry. It's dependence. It's dependence. Same way with the flowers in the field. I have a wife and four daughters. We need a warehouse to take care of the clothes. <laughs> and on Sunday morning, we open the closet and say, I don't have a thing to wear. <laughs> we laugh. I can tell you, Lucy really hasn't been that much, but, but we have clothes on clothes on clothes. And the truth of the matter is, most of us have more than we can wear. That's right. I want you to think about this just a little bit. He says, consider the lilies. Now, what they had there, those lilies grew wild. Now, we're not talking about Easter lilies. These are a, a smaller version that grows in the Middle East. And there, they grow wild in the fields. And what they would do is uh, 
uh, these legs come up, and then in order to start their uh, ovens and stuff like that, they take the dried grass, dried flowers, throw them in the oven. And yet, if you see those lilies, we've all seen lilies and their beauty, how intricate they are, what God does for them. And it is true, uh, we, may, we may look beautiful, but we don't come close to the flowers of the field. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, along the, the roadways, uh, people have gotten so they're, they're starting to sow wild flowers so that you get these patches of just an explosion of color. God does that. Okay? And they're there for a while and then they disappear. And if God does that for them, don't you think he'll make sure you look nice for church? Amen. See what I mean? And we've got to think about that stuff. Because the problem is because we don't think about that stuff, then we worry. Oh dear, it's going to be a short paycheck. What am I going to do? Are we going to have enough to eat? Uh, what about this that's coming up? Okay? we got to think about those things. Next, the next way to, to stop worrying is to refocus. Our problem is, is that we're focused on us. And he says, and what Jesus says is, don't worry about your food, your dress, and things like that. The pagans run after that. Okay? People that are unsaved, that's the kind of stuff they worry about. You seek the kingdom. And here, one of the reasons why I, I choke, I, I prefer the Luke over the uh, Matthew account, is Matthew says, seek first the kingdom of God. And most of us don't realize that that's about the priority first, not about uh, <coughs> making that first in your life. <coughs> most of us think, okay, I'll seek the kingdom, and then I'll go after this, all this other stuff next. It's not what he's saying. Keep it first. He says, seek the kingdom. Let that be your focus. You do that. We are different than the, the, uh, the pagans around us. And our job is to seek the kingdom. And he says, the pagans run after food, uh, drink, and personal place. That's what they run after. We need to focus in on kingdom concerns. Now, kingdom concerns are broad and all of those things. But if we will get away from focusing on ourselves and focus on the kingdom, he said, oh, I'll add that stuff to you. Uh, the third thing is found in verse uh, 34. He says, where your heart is, or where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, your treasure is the most valuable thing you have. Your treasure, most valuable thing you have, right? Where your treasure is, uh, or, uh, there your heart will be also. If you're worried about your clothes, and car, and house, and all of those things are what is your first and primary consideration, that's where your heart will be. But if you're really worried about the kingdom, worried about the kingdom concerns and stuff like that, your heart will be there, and those things have a way of taking care of yourself. And it's a matter of refocusing and changing your heart, changing what your first love is. Let's talk about the theme here. Trust God to supply your daily needs. Interesting, interesting story in Exodus chapter 16. The children of Israel have come out of Egypt. Uh, Pharaoh's army has drowned the Red Sea. And they are now out in, I just think this is a, a really neat name. They're out in the desert of sin. <laughs> but uh, they're in the desert and they begin to grumble. They don't feel like they have enough to eat. Oh dear. We should have just stayed there in Egypt and died there. At least we wouldn't have died hungry. And at that point, 
God hears their grumbling and he says, okay, I'm going to send quail in the evening and in the morning I'll send you, I'll take care of things. And so what happens is they wake up in the morning and just after the dew lifts off the ground, there are these white flakes that are all over the ground. God says, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out and each morning, each morning, I want you to gather an omer for every uh, person. Now, I don't know how much an omer is, but it was about that much, you know. <laughs> um, but I want you to get an omer for each person and uh, you can fix this for the day. Now, on after the sixth day, I want you to gather twice as much so that you don't have to gather it on the seventh day. <laughs> But I want you to go out and I want you to gather it day by day. And what happens is the, the, we find that the Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. Each gathered as much as he needed. Each morning, everyone gathered as much as they needed. This is a lesson in trust. Think about it. All you can get, all you can get is what you can use today. Now, some people thought that they would get it, and so they got a bunch. And the next morning, their tent stunk to high heaven, and there was maggots all through it. Okay? They weren't trusting. It's a lesson in trust. You gotta depend on them. Every day, you gotta get what you need. I want you to think about the importance of this lesson that God has them daily get their food. I want, you, I want you to think about this. They had a whole lot more, a whole lot bigger things they were going to have to trust them for coming up. They were going into the promised land. There were giants in the land. They were going to go through some very difficult country. They were going to have to go through a desert where there wasn't water. They were going to have to do lots of things. And there were going to be a whole lot bigger things that they had to trust him for, but this was foundational. Oh, God took care of my daily needs. He's going to take care of these other needs. And so when we begin to take a look at this, we begin to see that this is a lesson in trust uh, to meet our daily needs. Trusting God for daily food strengthened them to trust him for the promised land. A lesson in trust. Did you realize that in the Lord's Prayer, He gives us one line that is right along this. I want you to look at it. It says, give us today what we need for the next week and a half. <laughs> right? Myers doesn't have any good sales on this week, God. <laughs> no. Give us today our daily bread what we need for today. And so when we begin talking about trusting God, it's this thing that it's enough for today. Much of our anxiety comes not from what we have today, but fear of what we might not have in the future. Most of us are rarely, if ever, hungry. We eat to keep from getting hungry. <laughs> now it's obvious that I've done all <laughs> <laughs> But our point is that our worry is not what's here today. It's the what if. What if. What if. Now, I'll let that one go. Um, 
but we're looking to the future of what we might not have. And the problem is that we need to realize that we need to trust God for today and let tomorrow take care of itself. Having God to meet our help, having God to help us meet our obligations. It's one thing, you know, we've got these daily necessities, but we worry about being able to pay our bills too, right? You know? Rent comes, the electricity comes, house payment comes, all those obligations are coming, and we worry about those in many cases more than we do food brain. This is a funny story. Really, it is. It's common. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of uh, the two drachma tax came to Peter and asked, Doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. Uh, what do you think, Simon, he asked? Uh, from whom do the kings of earth collect duty and taxes? From their own sons or from others? Now remember, we're paying a temple tax. Who owns the temple? Who is Jesus? Okay, you get, are you beginning to get the joke? Who pays uh, uh, from their own sons or from others? Well, from others, Peter answers. Uh, then the sons are exempt, Jesus said to him. <laughs> you get the joke. It's, the sons are exempt. Okay. I'm exempt, Peter. <laughs> it's my house. Okay. Uh, but, so that we may not offend them, go to the lake and throw out your line, take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Now look at this. If we need to pay our taxes and whatever, if, we, if, we're, if, 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 if it's necessary, God will send it to fish's mouth. Okay? Notice how he supplies our obligations. Now again, we can't be foolish. That's another topic. We'll talk about that later. But what we're talking about now is we've got to have a trust that God is going to take care of us and help us with our obligations. Prosperity involves not only trusting for our needs, but also for our obligations. When you're relaxed and knowing that God's going to take anything, you know you're prosperous. It's okay. You're happy. Life is good. I'm not worried. The best indicator of trust is tithing. You knew I was going to get around to that, didn't you? <laughs> the best indicator of trust is tithing. Tithing fruit, first fruits. Now here, you know, we talk about first fruits. We throw that term around a lot. Those of you who have been in church and say, oh, you tithe the first fruits, and say, what's that? Well, the first fruits that people tithe, that they tithe, that was a, a farming and agricultural society. And when the harvest started in, they took the first fruits, they brought them to the temple, and they gave them to God before the harvest was even finished. It was the first fruits. Were they the best? Not necessarily. Um, the, uh, the first part of some of the crops are used may not even be as good or as sweet as some of the, uh, some of the, the fruit or grain that ripens a little later. But they took and they tithed a tenth of the first fruits and they brought it in. But why is that important? Well, if the harvest isn't in, you don't necessarily know that there's going to be enough. Right? But when I tithe that, I'm saying, yeah, it'll be okay. God's going to take care of me. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crop. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over. Wow. Interesting, isn't it? But we often think of tithing more as an obligation. But it has to do with a statement about how much we trust God to 
use the 90% to make it go. We are so blessed that most of us tithe out of our abundance. <coughs> Pardon me. Interesting story. I love it. This is one of my favorite stories. Uh, Jesus is sitting in the temple. And as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put all she had to live on. Charlie, will you and Lucy come, please? She, out of all, out of her poverty, gave everything she had. Who was trusting God more? The rich, who gave a, a big gift, to be sure, and was certainly doing it, but believe me, there was more where that came from. Or this little widow who put in small, two small copper coins, a couple of pennies. Jesus stopped the line. Why? Well, because she didn't have anything more. She didn't know if she was going to eat today or tomorrow. But she trusted God for that with everything she had. And I think that calls to us to trust God with everything we have. Prosperity is more about attitude than possessions. It's more about trust than possessions. It's more about dependence upon God to give the means to earn. Now we start out saying, hey, you got to earn prosperity, right? Okay, well, if you got to earn it, you got to trust God for the means to do it. The job, whatever it is, you've got to do that. It's being content with enough for the present and trusting that God will supply in the future. I want to close this sermon with a song. First time I heard this song, I loved it. I sing it every now and then. You go ahead. Yeah. 